genetic starts with the phenotype and it looks to find the genotype, whereas reverse genetics alters the genotype and sees the effects on the phenotype. So phenotype forward, but what is a phenotype? What is a genotype? What the heck do all these terms mean and how do we study them? So genetic instructions are held in the form of DNA and in the form of genes, which are the instructions for making like individual proteins or like functional RNAs and stuff that we'll not get into. Um, but basically your genotype is what version of that genetic information do you have? What are like the sequence, what's the specific sequence that you have? And then the phenotype is what effects does that have? What does it mean to functionally for you to have that specific gene. So for example, take fur color in mice. So say there's a gene that causes mice to have brown fur. And so they want, scientists want to find what this gene is. So if they take mice with brown fur, and then they look and see what find what it is in their genotype that causes that brown fur. That's an example of forward genetics. So forward genetics are starting with the phenotype and looking to find the genotype. So remember, forward phenotype. With reverse genetics, now you're going the other way. So you found that gene. Now, if can you put that gene into mice that are like white haired and see if that causes them to now have brown fur? So that would be an example of reverse genetics. So with reverse genetics, you're introducing the genotype to recreate the phenotype. So there are a variety of different, different types of experiments that we can do um, at many levels um, to in forward and reverse genetics. And we're going to talk about some of the classical approaches, some of the more modern approaches, um, and things like that. One way to think of it is kind of like light. Um, and so white light is basically all the colors of the rainbow. And so if you were to stick a light through a prism, you're gonna get it separated into all of those different colors of the rainbow. There are molecules called chromophores that can absorb light. Um, so like in a dye, there's gonna be chromophores that are molecules or chemicals that can actually absorb certain wavelengths of light. So if you think of those light as being um, all of the different wavelengths um, have different color, the colors correspond to different wavelengths with different energies. Um, and these chromophores can absorb specific wavelengths only. And then what you're going to see is kind of what's left over. So you're going to see what that is still one wavelength, and then you see what looks over, what's left over. So you're seeing what's opposite on the color from what they've stolen on the color wheel. So if you were to observe a, say you were to observe a orange or red light. Um, so this would mean that you would have a blue light catcher because it's stealing the blue light. And so you're seeing the rest, what's left over, which looks orangish. Um, and so basically your phenotype would be this orange light, but your core genotype, this isn't really a genotype, but just like in sort of an analogy term, what you would be seeing, what the cause of this is, is that you have this blue light catcher. And so if you were to take this, what you see, so you take this orange light, and then you were to put it through a prism to separate it into the individual wavelengths, now you would be able to find the cause, you'd be able to say, oh, ha, there's a blue-white catcher. And so that's kind of the idea of forward genetics, whereas you're basically you're taking this and looking to see what was this. Whereas with reverse genetics, basically you're starting by saying, okay, well, if I put a blue-light catcher in there, what am I going to see? And so that is basically the idea with reverse genetics is that you're making a change and introducing some change in the genotype and looking to see what the effect is on the phenotype. So remember forward starts with phenotype, forward phenotype, forward phenotype, forward phenotype. I also have to remind myself this because it seems kind of backwards to me, but the way to also remember this is like forward genetics is kind of more of like the classical genetics. So when you think about all of those experiments with fruit flies, um, trying to isolate um, flies with weird phenotypes. So flies maybe that were wandering around strangely or they had strange eye colors and then looking to see what was the genetic cause of that. Um, so if you can remember like this for genetics is being more the more classical approach, um, they weren't going around and actually doing CRISPR and changing 
specific making specific introduction introducing specific genetic changes into those flies they were just using like random mutagens and that sort of thing um and so the forward genetics approach um because that's another way to remember is that this is the more classical approach and it can be basically because you're starting with what you see um, you don't have to have knowledge of what it is precisely that it is that causes that to in order to see the thing. Whereas with reverse genetics, you kind of have to know more what you are, what is the cause of some effect, um, or what in what is going to what effect is it going to have? Basically, it's you have to start knowing um, some sort of information, or at least be able to easily find the information. So, but we need to kind of, so that's the basic overview, but we need to kind of suss out these terms a little more because it's important to notice, note that there are going to be complications when it comes to kind of defining a phenotype and defining um, genotypes simpler because basically you can just look at the genetic information and see what version you have. I mean, there could be complications if you want to go like, okay, are we looking at the really, really nitty gritty scale, like individual letter? Or are we looking at the, a little wider scale, just looking at like genetic markers? We'll go more into these things. But with the phenotype, because it's what you're observing, basically you have to think about, okay, well, what level am I observing at? Am I observing tiny little proteins? Am I looking at individual proteins and saying, does this protein have like a sort of molecular phenotype? Is this protein acting a little different, is it binding things a little differently? Am I looking at the cellular level? Are there some weird things going on in the cells and maybe some differences in sorts of concentrations of various things, different RNAs being uh, express that sort of thing or am I looking at the broader broader effect am I looking at like the person scale is this person actually can you tell that there's something different about them just because of that one gene and things get really even more complicated because we have a lot of redundancy in our genetic information um, so changes in one gene might not even show up um, because we have a lot of backup genes. So if you uh, mutate one copy of it, there's plenty of other copies to back up. And a lot of times changes don't show up until you're under like stress conditions or specific circumstances. So for an example, um, when we talked about bacterial growth, how things could be like oxytrophic or autotrophic. And so if they're autotrophic, they make their own. And if they're oxytrophic, they can't make their own. Um, and so if you are growing them in media, so in bacteria food that have the thing that they can't make, but they still need, it doesn't matter that they can't make it because you're giving it to them. Whereas in an environment where you're not giving it to them, now you would see the effect. And so phenotypic, dif phenotypic differences can be kind of masked um, if the circumstances are such that you don't need the thing that is changed or the change isn't going to show up. Another um, kind of more fun example is say, or I guess it's not fun for the clown, but imagine a circus where there's a clown and it breaks its leg. If you're only looking at, if you go to the circus and all that the clown is supposed to do is juggle, um, then well, it doesn't really, you're not even, maybe not, you don't even know that the clown has broken his leg, it's got his cast under his costume, and you don't know anything's different. But now, if you ask that clown to go ride a unicycle or do some weird, like, acrobatics, now you're going to notice that the clown has a broken leg. And so it all depends on kind of how you're looking and what you're looking at. And so this is just me speaking from more of like a molecular biology, biochemistry standpoint, how it can be really complicated when we talk about what a phenotype is and how what a phenotype is is going to depend on basically how you define it. Um, so you can say like, under these conditions, it has this phenotype, whereas normally it doesn't have any effect. Or you can say it has this phenotype where under these circumstances, it doesn't blah, blah, blah. So another thing that can get complicated is that papers often talk about like rescuing a phenotype. And so sometimes you might think, okay, well, so they're recreating a phenotype, but then they're actually talking about they're rescuing cells from a phenotype. So if a phenotype causes a problem, then they can rescue the phenotype by fixing, by causing, some, doing something to change or compensate so that the cells don't have a problem. So the terminology can get really confusing. And um, 
it's just something to keep an eye out and make sure that you're really thinking about what the paper is talking about when they're talking about phenotype, when they're talking about rescuing a phenotype and that sort of thing. So really um, got to use your critical thinking skills, especially if you're not, um, you're not really in the, that's not your expertise in that area because sometimes people use the term in other ways. So yeah, it can be complicated is my point. So let's get into more detail about how we actually go about doing these things. So we'll start with the forward genetics. Um, so this is the more like classical genetics in the sense that at least theoretically wise, the, the direction that you're going. So that doesn't mean that the techniques we use are the same as the techniques that were used a long time ago, but so we have more modern techniques and that sort of thing. But the idea is the same that you're observing something and then you're looking to see what caused it. Um, and so we need to look a little bit, step back a second and think about what is actually causing these things. And so what we're talking about when we're talking about all of this, the Typically, often what we're looking at is we're looking at changes in the DNA that are going to lead to changes in the protein um, that are made. Um, so sometimes these changes are in the protein itself. Sometimes the changes are in what proteins are expressed. Sometimes the changes are in genetic regions that aren't actually making proteins. Maybe they're making regulating proteins. Maybe they're uh, making functional RNAs, things like microRNAs and stuff that I study, but that's just more complicated um, to get into. And often what we're looking at are changes in protein, or at least that's often what scientists are looking at. Um, so they're looking at like codon regions or like the exosome and that sort of thing. So what is actually expressed? Oh, there's probably a lot of changes in other reasons that are actually functionally important, um, but are often overlooked and harder to study and that sort of thing because they're more variable and less is known about them. Um, so that's just something to be aware of, um, but we'll focus on what's traditionally looked at, which is more like the exosome. So the places that are actually making proteins. Um, and so the instructions for making these proteins are housed in the form of DNA. Um, this DNA gets transcribed into messenger RNA copies, and these messenger RNA copies are used to make proteins. So the messenger RNA has the instructions for making the protein, and the messenger RNA um, is then read out by these protein-making complexes called ribosomes. If there are changes in the genetic instructions, then that, will lead, that can lead to changes in the protein. Not necessarily because basically there's redundancy in the genetic code. Um, so the genetic code is basically written in these three letter chunks called codons, which spell individual amino acids or protein letters. And you can see that there are multiple codons that spell like the same amino acid. So you can have changes that don't actually change the protein. Um, and you can also, um, so, and that sort of thing. Um, but there are changes that do change the protein um, and cause more drastic changes. But the basic idea is that changes in the DNA may have an effect on the protein. And if we can find those changes in the DNA, those, so those changes in the DNA um, can affect the phenotype. And then we see this phenotype and we want to find what were the changes in the DNA that caused it. So you can think of cases where you would want to be able to find the causes of something. So for say example, on a genetic disease, um, if you want to find the cause of a genetic disease, um, you start with the effects, what are the effects of having this disease? And then you look to find, try to find the gene that is responsible for that disease. Um, if we talk about the really early genetics, um, the first four genetics experiments, we're talking about things like mutating fruit flies. So we, in that case, you're introducing mutations, but just like randomly. And then you're observing, like finding some flies with some cool phenotypes. So maybe these flies have red eyes or they have some weird, they're walking around in circles or that sort of thing. And then you wanna find out why, but the mutations were introduced randomly. And so similarly in genetic diseases, you're not actually going in and changing a gene on purpose. These mutations just happen or in the lab, they happen because you introduce, you purposely introduce mutations, but not necessarily in specific places. So you need to find where that mutation was made um, in order to kind of connect the phenotype to the cause. So when you do, so it's, if you want to find the cause of a genetic disease, you can 
imagine the importance of that. Or if you want to find what causes a specific function in an organism, it can be really hard, um, especially because although we're talking about like individual genes, as we'll see, there's actually most phenotypes are actually not caused by a single genetic change. Um, so most of basically, if you're talking about things like heart disease, if we're talking about things like um, even height, that sort of thing, it's actually a combination of a lot of different genetic genetic causes that are kind of like acting together. And so it's not typically not so simple as like a simple single gene leading to a single phenotype. Um, but in a lot of like the classical genetic studies and stuff, that's what we're talking about as well as some um, sort of classical genetic, um, genetic disorders. And this is what is easier to um, talk about and conceptualize at least to begin with. So with these four genetics approaches, basically we're looking at the phenotype and we want to see, okay, so what's causing it? So this can be, this can be difficult. Um, and so we'll talk about some traditional methods and some more modern methods. So traditional methods involve like gene mapping, which we'll talk about. Um, these days, it often observes these things called GWAS or genome-wide association studies, um, or for newer for genetic screens. Um, so in this case, so remember with those flies and stuff, they're introducing they're using chemicals like random mutagens, so chem, um, chemicals that are going to cause mutations, but kind of randomly. Um, and so it's going to be hard to find because these are random. You're going to then have to go in and look and see, okay, well, what mutations did I actually make? We can nowadays things um, you can make changes with like barcoded uh, that are barcoded. Um, and so this way you can kind of mark the changes that you make and make them easier to find. Um, so if you do like a screen, so if you make a lot of changes, but you have it in a way that when you're making the changes, you're leaving behind a mark then you can then go and look and pull, if you find a cool phenotype, see what marks are associated with it. Um, so it's easier to find what you changed. Um, so you can do like big sort of barcoded CRISPR-y type screens and stuff. So let's, let's start with the more of the um, traditional gene mapping approaches. Um, and so if you have a genetic disease, say, often the, so these diseases can be like dominant or recessive. So basically you get two versions of each gene, except for the sex links genes, um, one on each copy of the chromosome. And so in a recessive disorder, you need both copies to be mutated in order to have this phenotype show up. Um, if they're both okay, then you have like a normal phenotype. Um, and if you have um, and when we have two of the same things, we call them homozygous. If you're heterozygous, so if you have one of each, um, then you can either be like an asymptomatic carrier or symptomatic depending on the disease. And the, also depending on the circumstances. So you might have a phenotype that only shows up say under conditions of stress where that one good copy isn't good enough um, to suffice. So this goes back to the idea of phenotype being kind of tricky to, um, tricky to define and sometimes hidden. But, um, when you get, when those chrome, so you have one copy uh, from each chromosome, but what happens is that when you're um, in this process of recombination, um, so even though each, so each parent is going to pass on one version of the chromosome, so you're going to get one from each parent, but when the parents, like, in the process of making their gametes, so like the sperm of the ova, each chromosome is going to be um, duplicated so the parent cell still has one when it passes it off. Um, and, but one of their chromosome from their mom and from their dad, I'm talking about like at the biological sense, um, these are going to kind of match up and cross over during this gamete making process. And this is called recombination. So this makes it so that the chromosome that you inherit from your mom has some of your grandma and some of your grandpa in it. And the one that you get from your dad has some of your grandma and your grandpa from it, from that side of the family. Um, and so that way you're going to get kind of like these mixed chromosomes. And what happens is that regions that are closer together are going to be like linked. So they're more likely to be when you swap this genetic information from these different chromosomes to make these kind of like hybrid chromosomes the regions that are closer together are more likely to be inherited together. And so we call these genetically linked. 
If you have the mutation that's like causing something, so say this red band is causing a specific phenotype, this is going to be like co-inherited with these things that are near it. So it's going to be kind of like linked to these other things, even though these other things don't, don't cause it. It'll be like associated or correlated with them. And so this is going to be an important concept. Um, and so if we can find the things that are near it, um, even if we can't find the thing, the actual thing that causes it, at least at first, if we were to be able to say, find that pale orange band, now we would be able to say, and if we were to say, okay, well, all the people who have this disease have this pale orange band. Even if the pale orange band isn't actually causing the disease, it gets you closer to finding what actually is causing the disease. And so this pale orange band can act as a sort of marker. So there are different types of genetic markers that we can talk about, and then we can kind of like track and try to find associations between these markers that get us closer to finding the actual cause. Um, so different types of markers. Um, so one of the more traditional forms are like restriction um, fragment link polymorphisms. So restriction enzymes are DNA cutters that recognize specific DNA sequences and cut them. Um, and so you can imagine that in the genome, there's going to be a lot of variation in regions that aren't protein coding, so that don't have protein making instructions. Um, one of the reasons it's so hard to kind of find the effects of various things in these regions is that they're really variable between people. And you can have different, um, like there's a lot of sort of DNA that has a lot of replicative regions. Um, and so these regions often get like duplicated. And so you can have these polymorphisms, these differences in lengths of these segments um, and that don't necessarily have any effects that we know of, but they make it so that if you were to cut the regions on either side of the variable length region, you would see different lengths in different people. And so this can be used as a sort of marker. Um, we can also these days typically use like SNPs. Um, so SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. So we're talking about a polymorphism. Um, we're just talking about like a difference. So not necessarily a difference that has any sort of known phenotypic consequence, but just a difference that allows us to say, oh, there's a difference here. And so if we use techniques like PCR that are able to make copies of specific sequences or that are able, to, if we use sequencing to actually sequence and see what people, what um, genetic letters people have in that spot. So what is, what is their like SNP profile? Then we can use those as markers <clears throat> to see what, um, to to basically then compare between different people. And this allows us to get information about the people's like pheno genotype without actually having to sequence the entire genome. And so this gets into what we're talking about like GWAS studies a lot um, these days. So basically these are looking at a lot of, typically looking at a lot of different SNPs. So in this graph I got <clears throat> from Wikipedia, um, from this Nature Communications article, Holes et al. Um, 2019, from, they basically, so each, this is what we call like a Manhattan plot. And so each of these dots is going to represent a SNP. And then these are showing like on all the different chromosomes. So they're not sequencing the entire genome. They're just looking at these specific, specific locations that they know there are differences between people, that there are common like polymorphisms. And then they're looking to see, okay, so what if we, if we separate, so the people that have these kidney, kidney stones and the people that don't have kidney stones, are there genes that show up or, or are there SNPs that show up more frequently in the people that have kidney stones? And so those are going to be shown um, as the higher peaks um, because this is showing like the association level. So again, though, this is showing you like a marker. This is not necessarily showing you the actual band. So this is showing you something that might be close to it and it might not be. And it might be just like that people that happen, happen to, these things happen to kind of come together or people have some sort of similar ancestry that's causing this, but it's not actually causing the disease. But sometimes this can lead you to being able to then look closer at what is around this SNP um, to see what the cause is. Um, so GWAS is typically is, is used a lot these days. Um, when we have 
a this is like a classical classical example of ch traditional sort of genetic mapping is finding the cystic fibrosis gene on um, the CFDR gene. I mean the, the gene um, the mutation that causes cystic fibrosis. Um, and so this took a lot, a lot of work. Um, and so I have a post on this. Um, it's really impressive. It was a collaborative effort of two teams, um, one led by Francis Collins at the University of Michigan and the other by Lap Shi Su at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. Um, and they had to find the gene and then clone it, sequence it, characterize it, and make sure that it's actually the one that they were looking for. Um, and so they made all these DNA libraries with different regions of the of the DNA from these cells, and then basically had to find markers that allowed them to kind of map out the where the gene um, was. So they got close to it, and then they were able to actually use like probes um, that so basically specific art, they use specific labeled RNAs that were basically expressed in the cells known to be affected by cystic fibrosis to see what difference, what changes might be, what regions might be functionally important, and then looking to see what was the difference between patient samples and samples from their healthy relatives. And they were able to narrow it down to this one specific mutation. So know that there are different mutations in this gene that can cause um, CFK, um, cystic fibrosis. Um, but in this case, they found um, this really cl this classic mutation delta F08 uh, 508. Um, so delta's like it's missing. So it's missing this um, this amino acid phenylalanine um, in this one in this spot. Um, and so then they were able to do some genetic analysis and stuff to see that they really found it. So now this led to the ability to do a lot of reverse genetics to really figure out why it is that this mutation is causing this effect. Um, so with reverse genetics, we're basically now we're able to change, directly change the genotype to observe the phenotype. So we're purposely changing, we're purposely changing so we can introduce that mutation, say, to cells in a dish, to animal models, to, in the, to proteins that we express um, recombinantly. So basically we stick the genetic instructions for making the protein into cells, and then we get those cells to make it for us. And because we're introducing this genetic instructions into those cells, we can make changes to those genetic instructions to mimic the changes that um, were present, say, in in the in the patient samples or to make change various changes that um, we predict have certain effects and we want to see if they actually do have those effects. Um, so we, there are different types of reverse genetics techniques and we can kind of think about if we want to change things in the cell or if we want to change things more like in vitro. So just like in a test tube. Um, so depending on what we want to do, we can do different things to kind of to kind of test things at different levels. And so this is where you often see different types of experiments done by different labs, um, by different fields, um, and that are all often very complementary to one another, just providing information at different levels. So in order to make the changes there, we can either make, we can make changes at different levels. Um, so if you want to, we can change the gene itself, so directly change the genotype, or what we can actually do is we can just change the levels of the messenger RNA. Um, so either way, we're kind of messing with the genetic information, but when we're doing it at the gene level, we're making permanent changes. When we're doing it at the messenger RNA level, we're just changing the amount of copies that get made or how stable those copies are. So with gene editing techniques such as CRISPR, you're changing the gene itself. So you can either alter the gene or like delete it. So I put delete in quotes because often what you're doing is basically you're just introducing a dramatic change in the gene. It's a lot easier to kind of just like mess things up than to specific, I mean, to specifically to mess up a specific gene than it is to, to specifically mess up a specific gene. Um, so basically with CRISPR, the Cas systems, you basically guide these Cas proteins um, to a specific to a specific DNA sequence using a guide RNA. And then this Cas protein will make cuts. And then if you basically don't give it any other, if you just give it the guide RNA, 
it'll basically make a cut at the region you say, but then it's gonna, if you, it'll try to basically stitch the ends together through um, this process called non-homologous end joining, um, NHEJ. And this can often be, um, this is problem prone, trouble prone, what's the word? Uh, but basically it often makes damage so that the protein doesn't get made. Um, so basically here you're just, you're making the protein so the protein doesn't get made, but you're not necessarily actually cutting out the entire protein. Um, this is often why you'll see that people will use multiple guide RNAs, test different guide RNAs, and then also show that they validate the genetic knockout so that they show like a Western blot or something showing that the protein isn't actually expressed. Um, and so that's just a technical note. Um, there are also different types of CRISPR-Cas systems. Some of them are, can be more precise, especially nowadays, there's a lot of different variations. Um, CRISPR can also be used for gene editing, like in cells. So if you want to introduce a specific mutation, or if you want to switch the version of a gene that someone has, that sort of thing. If you put in different DNA, then they can kind of use this homology, um, to fix it by homology. Um, and so basically regions that look similar, it'll kind of stitch them together. And so you can have it cut out one region and put in a new region. Um, and so that you're influencing things at the level of the DNA. You can also use like RNA interference, RNAi, um, introduce small RNAs, which are going to direct a different type of protein, an argonaut protein, to the messenger RNA. So not to the DNA itself, but to those messenger RNA copies. So we want to direct them to those messenger RNA copies um, and then cut them and degrade them and so they can't get made. Um, so here you're not making permanent changes, but you are making changes at the level of the mRNA. Um, and these are going to allow you to see what the specific protein was doing. Um, and so here you're not introducing like an actual change in the protein, you're just introducing, seeing like, okay, well, what does that protein do? So we're not really talking about the exact phenotype here, but more about the having or not having the protein. Like, it's not like you can say, if you have a difference in this protein, would it be this way with, these, with this sort of technique? Um, whereas with CRISPR, if you were actually like change the gene, um, then you would be able to see that. There are also techniques where you can basically knock out the original gene and then supplement the gene. So you basically knock out the original gene so you have cells that don't make this protein. And then you can kind of add back in different versions of the protein, say like on a plasmid, um, to see how those different versions, whether they can compensate and that sort of thing. So that's another thing that is often done. Um, and it's a lot easier to do things when you're working in vitro. So if you're working, even if even in cells, it's, easy, it's a lot easier than like in animal models, that sort of thing. Um, but when you're working just like in a test tube, so we're working with like recombinant proteins. So these proteins that we stick in cells like bacteria or that sort of thing, um, we, we can really make mutations to using this technique called site-directed mutagenesis to introduce really specific changes in proteins um, and then be able to test um, their effects. And so if we can then purify the protein out of cells and test it, um, but then here we're going back to the idea of phenotype is here we can really only look at really small scale like molecular phenotypes like is it binding differently is it cutting differently is it doing whatever it's supposed to do differently. Um, but again we're only looking at what we're looking for. Um, and so there are effects with all these different things that you are going to be masked uh, effects that are only going to show up under certain conditions effects that can in the context of other proteins, in the context of other genes, in the context of all of the, the environment, all these various things um, can be masked, can be exaggerated, can be all these different complications. And so this is what part of the reason why science is so hard and why we have people from all the different disciplines um, looking at things using all these different techniques, trying to answer really similar questions a lot of the time. Um, but we really do need all of these different approaches and all these different levels. And they really feed into one another. If we can understand things at the molecular scale better, that can help us understand things at the population level. If we understand things better at the population level, it gives us insight into things that are happening at the molecular level. Um, so this is part of the reason I love science and I love that different people are really enthusiastic about different areas of researching and different 
angles at looking at these same sort of problems. Um, so that was basically a long winded story. Um, or really the point of today's post was, was this whole idea of genotype, phenotype, forward and reverse genetics. Um, and so, but it's also kind of a post that's basically, these are all just terminology. Um, so although these terminology, uh, maybe they'll come up in exams, maybe they'll come up in conversations at conferences or in papers. And so it's important that you know these terms, but at the end of the day, it's really more important that you get the concepts. Um, and no matter what we call it, um, there aren't often clear boundaries between these things. And really just, it's important to know the basic idea is that of this connection between the genotype and the phenotype, but that's really a lot, that's really very nuanced and complicated, but there are different ways that we can study these sort of questions. And we've gone over some of the methods that are used to study these sort of questions. And so I hope that this was helpful and forward phenotype.